So it's very thrilling to present the Lenchy collection of Elaine Romberg, a very, very important collection, not only for the quantity of remarkable dolls she has, but also for the message of the history of the firm that the dolls give us and looking at them from the very beginning. Um, Elena Di Scavini was kind of, her formative years were during those troublesome times in Europe in the 1910, 19, well, early 1900s. And she kind of thrived and grew up in intellectual and artistic circles um, within her family. She there's, it's said that at age 15, she ran away from home and joined the circus for about six months and her mother let her stay because she thought that that would be important. She uh, w worked within various artistic and, and literary circles and she had a lot of friends from there. Well, the war ended, World War I ended, and Italy was kind of in bad shape and she had to find a way to make a living. The family had no income at all. And so she kind of tried various things. And she then thought, I think I might make a doll. But how would I make a doll? One of the reasons she wanted to make a doll, and this is a quote that she has in some of her early works, and I love this quote. And I think that this says something not only about her work, but about all of us who are interested in the history of dolls, in the collecting of dolls, and the preservation of them. This is what she said. When I was a child, my doll was rags and sticks. My doll was nothing, and therefore she could become anything. My doll was nothing, and therefore she could become anything. I think that's an incredible mantra for the importance of dolls in a child's life, and also for those of us who enjoy their history and beauty today, it's, it's a good mantra to follow today. At any rate, she decided she could make dolls. And she then she said, well, what, what will I make them of? What will I make them? And she said, I know, I could make them of, of felt. And she connected with a hat making company in Turin, where she was, and worked with making a mold because they could take the felt and steam press it over the mold and form the face of the doll. I'm so fortunate, I'm so fortunate to be able to have a collection like this to work with because in working with it, I'm able to trace the evolution of dolls, their construction of them, how they were made, the materials that they used. And a couple things become very clear. Number one, the doll maker becomes more sophisticated in their techniques and in their fabrics and in the painting and production of the doll. But number two, their vision kind of stays the same. And one of the things that you'll see as we go through this um, group of Lenchy dolls is that many of the characters keep being produced over and over again. And many of the same themes, the same colors. But let's start at the beginning and see where we go. In the earliest years, and this would be, well, her first ad appeared in 1920. There's not a catalog yet. No catalog appears until 1924. But in 1920, she had a full-page ad in <clears throat> O'Printemps' Christmas catalog for the Parisian department store in which she showed um, some of her earliest dolls. And when I first became aware of Lenchy dolls, I thought these dolls, oh, they're not very nice. And I'm sorry I'm saying that now because the fact is it was the material she was working with that was not as refined as it came to be. And we have here three early dolls from the very first year of production. We have the cowboy, we have what she called in the catalog, the chef Indienne, and we have Salome from the film that was coming out based on the costume worn by Theda Berra. And when you look at them, you might be tempted to say, oh, I don't think they're really good quality, but they are. They are for their importance of their time in the history of the company um, and what they represent, and I'm gonna turn a few around so you can see them. You notice he has his leather belt, he has his um, vest. When he comes back around, little details you'll see repeated over and over again. Um, we have the holster with the little pistol inside, his wonderful fur on the front, and the hand painting of the face with the side glancing eyes was a very dominant kind of feature at this time. Salome was fascinating. She was only appears to be made for one year. 
and we don't know why. The film was very scandalous. Um, I was reading a lot about this, and it, it was scandalous for a lot of reasons, ranging from how um, promiscuous she w appeared in the film, and also how it was kind of like an anti-religious type of thing. You have to go back and read all about it. It's pretty interesting. But she was only made for one year. However, what um, Elena Di Scavini, who started to trademark her dolls as Lenchi, so let's just call them Lenchi from here on, that makes it easier. Very, very interested in the theater, the Commedia dell'arte, and in the, uh, anything that was circus themed, anything that was um, themed of the performing arts. And look at our figures here of, of the Perot and of the Perrette. And the Perrette, I have her sitting by the side because I want you particularly to notice the spit curl coming onto her face. Uh, that type of thing was very, very important um, to um, Madame Di Scavini when she was doing it. There are two little children, two little girls standing there, and one in purple and one in pink, and they kind of look like really simplistic, but these dolls are very, very important. They were shown in the first year Lenchi catalog, and to have them, and, and that pink one, I mean, the costume is very simple, but it's original. You can even see the little square on her foot where there would have been a Lenchi label originally, that, which has sadly disappeared over the years. If we go up to the top, we're going to see a couple other examples of work that was done during this early period. And peeking out of the big cabinet on top, peeking out the window of the cabinet, are some of the miniatures that she made starting in the late 20s and in different varieties. Some of them were just known as miniatures and were um, little nine, eight and a half, nine inch dolls in um, sport costumes or in ethnic costumes. But the ones that I love are the ones that are on that middle shelf with the little bent knee and they're just, they're so adorable. They're six and a half inches and that little boy who's the golfer, wow. The detail that went into this design of the costumes. He, for example, look at his little shorts, the golfer boy. That's all little checkered pieces that had to be sewn together. Little tiny pieces, really, really important. Now, because she was interested in the Commedia dell'Art, look at our two um, performing dancers, and they are, they're featured on the cover of the catalog. They were in very, very early um, catalog production in the early 20s, and their costumes are unbelievable. How they were shown in the catalog is they were kind of almost like flying through the air, and I think if you had them today, you might want to display them that way, it's the same thing. Look at how she loved hot pinks because she repeated that in her masked harlequin, which is right at the bottom and even has all little accessories like the wooden um, baton and the mask. And these are all important pieces that she would have to have commissioned and made especially. In the early 1920s, uh, Lenchi created a series of Asian themed um, figures, they're very, very rare, so they, it's almost like they were made for a special um, commission or special exhibition, we really don't know. We do know that the Japanese visited her in her studio and tried to get her to um, make dolls for them that they could sell on a commercial basis, and she declined. But did she make pieces like this for them? He's an absolutely extraordinary piece. And this is an example of where you can see the kind of embroidery and workmanship that went into them. Look at this is all applique stripes on the sleeves. And look at the embroidery on the jacket. And then we open it. Look at the applique work and embroidery on the front vest and here and here. And even his wooden um, piece, which I've tried to get, have some of the lettering on here read. I don't, honestly, I'm, I don't know if it's Chinese or Japanese. Okay, I know it's not Chinese because I, asked my Chinese friend and they said it didn't, wasn't a language he knew, so I don't know what it is. But she was very fascinated with the entire Asian culture and produced some extraordinary dolls. Up on top, for example, is a very, very lovely one that she did. This is from her 300 series, but earlier on she did a larger one, very, very similar to that, and that's what we tried to get the medallion reading on the chest to what it said, but it made no sense to my Chinese friends, so I'm sorry. Maybe she was just drawing. I don't know. You could find out. That would be a 
research. Holding the wooden lantern, these wooden accessories on lynchies are very, very important to find out. Over to the left of her is a red-haired guy. He's a Russian, Russian Cossack, and this is really interesting. She was quite intrigued with the Russian dolls and with the whole Russian culture, and she made, um, she made several that were quite important at the time, and you're gonna see a few others that are coming up. This particular Russian Cossack, the 1917 to 1924 was the era of the Russian Revolution, and the Cossacks were very, very instrumental in fighting that. So was she, um, was she inspired by that? We don't know. Look at the little fellow down at his side. He comes a little bit later, maybe five or six years later, and I'm gonna put him in my book of, for children of what were they thinking because he is kind of holding a vodka jar. Let's, let's just face it, he is. So they were giving vodka to this little boy, but look at his costume, it's really great. Okay, now let's come back down. No, let's stay on that top shelf and look at that tall man up on top. And I know you all recognize who he is. He's Rudolph Valentino as the Sheik. And the costume is extraordinary. Again, so many details. I hope that many of you will be able to attend this auction in person. We're open and we want you to come, so please do. Or at least come for an exhibition so you can see in person all of the details of the workmanship, the embroidery, the applique, the sewing together of the fine pieces. She now is reaching a point where she's getting into really top quality of the felt product itself, really finely finished, and so it has a smoother, smoother look to it. Valentino, it's considered one of her finest works and very rare to find. Sitting down below him is um, a lady that is in wonderful exotic costume and again rare to find and one of the things that's notable painted teeth so you start noticing all of these little nuances of what were little extra features that made a particular doll a famous and she's notable for her painted teeth and her her lower you know her heavy eyelids and look at the turban when i was trying to describe these pieces i said how would you describe look at that multi-layered turban how difficult was that to make we just look at them and we kind of assume, oh, that's nice, or it's colorful, or I like the way that is. But then when you really start to study the making of it, you can really, really appreciate how much workmanship went into it. Moving again just to her left, we see a wonderful um, little red-haired boy, a Cupid boy, which is a really rare piece and a delightful theme to find. And then that wonderful clown that with those checkerboard pants that is so great. And you can depose him many ways. He's equally fascinating, posed seated as he is standing in this way. That face was not used on any other of her dolls. It was a unique face for that doll only. The large um, brown complexion doll that is standing next to the clown is notable for her size and also for her, um, her wonderful expression on her face. She, Len, she used side glancing eyes very often, and on some of the dolls, it's much more noticeable than on others. Next to her, up high, is another Russian doll. And one of the things that I, so I, again, I probably wasted an hour trying to find this out. Why are these Russian dolls all with red hair? So I look to see if there is, and there is one region of Russia that has a lot of red haired people, but. I don't know why she would have made all of her Russian dolls with red hair, and if somebody can tell me, then I'm just ignorant, and I would love to know the answer, and I'll share it with all of you. But look at the embroidery on his jacket. He was named Ivan, and you can even see, look at the detail on his boots, all of the embroidery detail on his boots. He's absolutely wonderful. Len, she had a way of, I mentioned you earlier, of if a theme was good to her, if she liked it, she would repeat it for a number of times. So you can see, standing next to him is one of the little tiny eight inch lenchies, eight to nine inch lenchies that, that were known as the miniatures, wearing not virtually the same jacket, but the same concept jacket with the gloves in, um, tucked into the sash 
and the same kind of embroidery, same kind of coloring. The tall guy would have been made in the early 20s and the little guy would have been made in the early 30s. So you see how she would carry themes through over a period of time. 